Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be exploring Forbidden Archaeology, the Hidden History of the Human Race, which is the title of a book co-authored by my guest Michael Cremo who co-authored that book with Richard Thompson. In fact, I had the privilege of interviewing Michael about that book about 20 years ago on the original Thinking Aloud program. And Michael is back now. He's authored a subsequent book titled Human Devolution, A Vedic Alternative to Darwin's Theory. Welcome, Michael. Good to be here, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you after so many years uh, once again. And you know, I was very excited by the book Forbidden Archaeology when we talked about it decades ago. Uh, and I know it's had a big impact uh, subsequently, although many of our viewers will not be familiar with your approach. So uh, uh, we're going to need to recap. A, a bit. I think the exciting thing about that book is is that what you have done is gone through archaeological journals that were published prior to uh, Darwin's work on his theory of uh, evolution and human descent. And what you find in there are many uh, high quality articles that couldn't have been published after Darwin because they seem to contradict his theory. Well, they were articles that were published before Darwin's theory became generally accepted mm -hmm. in the scientific world. Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species, in the year 1859. He didn't mention anything about human origins in that book. Mm -hmm. But he did talk about the evolution of species. He so, had a subsequent book, as I recall, on the descent of man. Yeah, the descent of man, published in 1872, is mm -hmm. when he first uh, himself personally broached the idea that humans like us evolved from more mm -hmm. primitive ape-like creatures. But after those books came out and his ideas began to circulate in scientific circles in Europe and around the world. Scientists interested in the question of human origins began searching for what they called a missing link. Mm -hmm. In other words, they assumed if humans like us did evolve from some originally existing ape-like creature, then there must be intermediates, mm -hmm. beings intermediate between apes and humans right. like us. So scientists began searching for that evidence in the 1870s, in the 1880s, in the 1890s. But it was very interesting what they were finding was not evidence for intermediates. <clears throat> they were finding evidence for humans like us existing in very, very ancient times, going back millions of years. Well, now, didn't they come up with uh, many different uh, branches of what they call hominids, who were sort of uh, more primitive. They weren't modern humans. That was a, a later development. Uh -huh. <clears throat> now, in, as I was mentioning, in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, they were going out, they were finding evidence for humans like us mm -hmm. existing in very ancient times. And that wasn't a problem because they didn't have their timeline for human evolution yeah. worked out. Mm -hmm. But in 1892, there was a key discovery by a Dutch researcher named Eugene Dubois. He went out to Java, which is an island in Indonesia. It was controlled by the Dutch at that time in the late 19th century. 
And he was doing his excavations at a site called Trenel. And he found in his excavations a skull that looked very ape-like. Mm -hmm. And he also found a thigh bone or a femur that looked quite human-like. Mm -hmm. And he put the two together, although they were found about 50 feet apart, he put them together and said, this is the Java ape man who he called Pithecanthropus erectus. Mm -hmm. So now scientists had finally, after decades of searching, their missing link, their intermediate mm -hmm. between ancient apes and modern humans. And it was found in layers of rock about one million years old. Mm -hmm. So at that point, they had to decide, well, what are we going to do with a far older evidence for a human presence that had accumulated during the previous decades? For example, you had the California gold mine discoveries, which were reported to the scientific world by Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was the chief government geologist of mm -hmm. California. He reported human bones and human artifacts found in layers of rock that modern geologists tell us are about 50 million years old. Mm -hmm. And there were many of these discoveries from Europe and the United States. So what happened was, after the Java Man discoveries became accepted, scientists decided that any evidence for a human presence earlier than that, say going back a million years or mm -hmm. more, was to be dismissed. So Couldn't all, be valid because it would contradict the now accepted theory of Darwin. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then when things like that were discovered subsequently after this new timeline had yeah. become fixed as a consensus in the scientific community, when anything showing a human presence was found over a million years old or so, it had to be either understood as some kind of mistake or it had to be interpreted in such a way that it fit mm -hmm. the accepted timeline. I'll give a, a very recent example of that. This is from the year 2000. 16, mm -hmm. a team of archaeologists headed by uh, Manuel Dominguez Rodrigo was conducting excavations at Ulduvai Gorge mm -hmm. in Africa, mm -hmm. in the country of Tanzania. Yep. It's a very important site. Many important discoveries have been made there. By the Leakies, as I recall. By the Leakies, for yeah. example. But this is a more recent mm -hmm. discovery from 2016. Mm -hmm. And it... it and, if I tell you what it is, it won't seem that significant. It was a finger bone. Uh -huh. uh, actually, this finger bone this, where my thumb the is little right finger. here, the little finger yeah. bone. Uh, but they very carefully analyzed this finger bone, and they compared its measurements with the finger bones of different species of apes and monkeys, mm -hmm. different species of hominins, ape men, in other words, like Homo erectus and Australopithecus. And they also compared it with the same finger bone of humans like us, mm -hmm. anatomically modern humans. And it turned out that this finger bone fit in the modern human group. It was different from any species of ape or monkey uh -huh. or hominid. Uh -huh. Ape men, in other words. Yes, a modern human. Now, the problem was it was found in layers of rock 1,800,000 years old. So in their report, which was published in Nature Communications, mm -hmm a prominent scientific journal, 
the discoverer said <clears throat> essentially, well, we've got this finger bone here. It's closest to Homo sapiens, but we can't call it Homo sapiens because of the <clears throat> age of the formation in which it was found, mm -hmm. 1,800,000 years old. Yeah. So it's a very recent example of what I call a process of knowledge filtration mm -hmm. that operates in the scientific world, especially mm -hmm. in the field of archaeology. Yeah. Well, as, as a parapsychologist myself, I'm very familiar with uh, how data gets suppressed if, if it doesn't seem to fit the prevailing paradigms. Uh, and I think that's normal, uh, unfortunately, but uh, especially for data-driven researchers uh, and scholars such as you, such as yourself, but it, it occurs in many areas, uh, not just archaeology and not just parapsychology. Uh, another area that uh, where I think data is being suppressed has to do with uh, low energy nuclear reactions. But um, in any case, your focus is is on archaeology, and I gather, uh, I recall from our earlier interview several decades ago that. There are many interesting findings about uh, potential human presence, modern human presence, on our planet, maybe even as old as a billion years. Well, those are some of the more extreme anomalies. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, anomalous discoveries are discoveries that don't fit uh, the dominant scientific consensus. And I think you're right. This process of knowledge filtration, which isn't really a conspiracy theory. It's just something that philosophers of science and historians of science have understood for a long time that theoretical preconceptions can influence how scientists react mm -hmm. to different categories of evidence that come to their attention. Yeah. But in archaeology, the dominant consensus is that humans like us first came into existence about 200,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. So if scientists encounter reports of evidence that humans like us existed in more distant times, far older than 200,000 years, they tend to think, well, something's got to be wrong with that. Yeah. Obviously, some mistake has been made, mm -hmm. or else they interpret the evidence in such a way that it does fit mm -hmm. uh, the dominant paradigm. You know, for example, in 1979, Mary Leakey found footprints at a place called Le Toli in the country of Tanzania in East Africa. And the footprints were found in layers of <clears throat> solidified volcanic ash about 3,700,000 years old. Mm -hmm. Now, in her initial report, which was published in National Geographic magazine, Mary Leakey said, the footprints are indistinguishable from modern human footprints. Mm -hmm. Other scientists also agreed, but neither Mary Leakey nor these other scientists believe that humans like us made those footprints. Mm -hmm. yep. So what they proposed was, well, there must have existed at that time, almost four million years ago, some type of hominin, some type of ape man who had feet mm -hmm. exactly like modern human feet. Now that's an interesting idea. It certainly solves the problem, but unfortunately there isn't any physical evidence no. to support that idea. You know, we have the skeletal remains of the hominins that existed at that time. They're varieties of 
uh, the genus Australopithecus, and the foot bones of Australopithecus have been discovered at a place called Sterkfontein in South Africa, and the foot structure of Australopithecus is not like that of a human being like us, mm -hmm. Homo sapiens sapiens. The foot structure is very ape-like. You know, the toes are very long. The first toe can move out to the side like the human thumb. Mm -hmm. Actually, the only creature known to science today that has a foot structure exactly like that of a modern human being is a human being like ourselves. So those Laetoli footprints were there. They mm -hmm. were almost four million years old. They looked indistinguishable from modern human footprints, but they were not interpreted in that way mm -hmm. as possible evidence yep. that humans like us were existing almost four million years ago on this planet. Mm -hmm. Now, you were mentioning uh, cases of evidence for a human presence perhaps going back one or two billion years. Yes. And as, as I mentioned, those are rather extreme mm -hmm. anomalies. Uh, the case that I was thinking about w involved some round metallic objects that yeah. were found in South Africa in the western Transvaal region. These spherical objects have parallel grooves mm -hmm. that go around the, the center of each one. And they give the appearance of having been machine made. Yeah, they, they give an, a, an appearance like that. And, you know, they've been analyzed. They're made of uh, a, a, a kind of iron ore called hematite, which is also considered to be sort of like a semi precious stone. You can get jewelry made of mm -hmm. hematite. Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, so they're interesting objects. Uh, nobody has provided to me a very convincing natural explanation how they could have formed in deposits over a billion years old in, in, in South Africa. If somebody could, well, I'd be prepared to accept that, but otherwise I'm ready to consider the possibility of them being evidence for an extremely ancient human presence mm -hmm. on this planet. Now, by human, uh, because all that we have are these uh, metal balls, uh, I'm assuming you're really just referring to some sort of a... Uh, I'll call them individuals who are capable of uh, creating an object like that. They might be nothing like uh, modern humans anatomically. Well, or they, they might be. Yeah. Maybe we just don't know on the basis of mm -hmm. that one piece of evidence. Mm -hmm. But there are cases of anatomically modern human skeletal remains being found in very, very ancient layers of, of, of rock. Mm -hmm. You refer to the California gold mine case earlier. Yes, that's one. Another, mm -hmm. another case, which isn't quite as old as that, but is still anomalous in terms of the current theories, which hold that we shouldn't be finding anatomically modern humans any further back than two or three hundred thousand years ago. Mm -hmm. And the case I'm thinking about here is the human skeletal remains that were found by the Italian geologist Giuseppe Ragazzoni in the late 19th century at a place called Castanedolo in northern Italy. He was conducting excavations there and he found several anatomically modern human skeletons in layers of rock that modern geologists consider to be about four million 
years old, mm -hmm. which now when many scientists today hear about a discovery like that, they say, obviously, something's got to be wrong here. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, those were intrusive burials. Mm -hmm. In other words, about four or five thousand years ago on the surface, some human being died and then his friends and relatives dug a grave and they placed the body down into that very ancient layer of rock at mm -hmm. Castanedolo, mm -hmm. four million years old. Now things like that can happen, they do happen, but the discoverer, Dr. Ragazzoni, was a professional geologist and he was very much aware of this problem. And mm -hmm. he said in his original report in the Italian language, published in a scientific journal, that if it had been a burial, then the layers of rock above the skeleton would have been disturbed. Yeah. And he said he looked very carefully when he was conducting his excavations, and he could see that all the overlying layers of rock were intact and undisturbed. In fact, he said, each layer of rock had its own micro stratification mm -hmm. that was undisturbed, indicating that the skeletons really did belong in the layer of rock in which they mm -hmm. were found, in this case about four million years. Now if there are only a couple of these cases, maybe you could, I think, try to set them aside in some way or uh, downplay their significance. But what I've shown in my work is that there are hundreds of these cases where archaeologists, geologists, and other scientists who are digging into the earth have found human bones, human artifacts, and human footprints that go far further back in time than the now dominant mm -hmm. consensus allows, as I said, about two or 300,000 yeah. years. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're going to talk about human antiquity, we should deal with a complete set of facts, mm -hmm. not some partial subset yeah. of the whole collection of evidence. Well, I, I would think that if, for example, it were determined that humans were four, or five, or six million years, modern humans on this planet, there's nothing that would make that inconsistent with uh, Darwin's theory of evolution. No, that, that wouldn't. But if we go back 50 or 60 million years, uh, that would place humans before the first primates, mm -hmm. even. In, in other words, before the first apes and monkeys. Yeah. So it would be uh, a little difficult you know, to accommodate that, that at would, least with the present theory. Yeah. Now, mm -hmm. uh, you could potentially come up with some new version of the Darwinian theory of yeah. evolution that could accommodate evidence like that. And I would say if anyone wants to do that as their way of accommodating the evidence, then uh, I welcome that. Basically what I've tried to do <clears throat> in my book Forbidden Archaeology is provide the complete data set mm -hmm. and what people do with that data set which includes this anomalous mm -hmm. evidence for extreme human antiquity what they do with it is their business mm -hmm. now they may try to explain it 
with some new version of the Darwinian theory of evolution. Some people I've known have appealed to time travel, mm -hmm. to time travelers yeah. to try to explain the mm -hmm. evidence for extreme human antiquity. Mm -hmm. Others appeal to extraterrestrial interventions. Mm -hmm. And then there's my favorite, just human beings like us have been around for a lot longer mm -hmm. than we now think and yeah. we need new explanations mm -hmm. for how they originally got got here mm -hmm. but i'm happy for people to come up with their own alternative mm -hmm. explanations because i really respect the the right and privilege of each mm -hmm. individual to make up their own minds about sure. these things. Well, let's review the best evidence uh, for human antiquity going back before primates. Well, I would say the California gold mine discoveries mm -hmm. are really a very, very good example because there you have many cases of human bones and human artifacts being discovered in layers of rock that date back to the early period, early part of the geological period called the Eocene, which means these things would be about 50 million years old. And if I'm not mistaken, currently, you know, biologists think the first apes and monkeys came into existence about 40 million years ago or mm -hmm. so. So, so that, that, those cases provide a very good example. What mm -hmm. happened was that in the 19th century, gold was discovered in California and miners went to get the gold. And to get the gold, they were digging tunnels into the sides of mountains, mm -hmm. like Table Mountain in the Sierra Nevada mountains near the town of Sonora in Tuolumne County, mm -hmm. California. And deep inside these tunnels, like the Montezuma, mining tunnel. Over, over 1,500 feet inside that tunnel, you know, the miners were finding obsidian spear points, stone mortars and pestles in other mining tunnels in the California gold mining region. They were finding human bones, other human artifacts. And these discoveries came to the attention of Dr. J.D. Whitney, who was a Harvard-educated geologist who had gone out to California. He'd become the state geologist mm -hmm. of California. So these discoveries came to his attention, and he went to the sites. He examined them personally, conducted interviews with the discoverers, thoroughly documented these discoveries and did his own personal research and then published a report that was released to the scientific world through Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. So these were uh, numerous discoveries very well documented by a prominent American scientist mm -hmm published in the professional scientific literature, but you know, we just don't hear very much about them today because of this process of knowledge filtration that I mentioned mm -hmm. a little bit earlier in our yeah. talk. There was a, a prominent anthropologist uh, William Holmes, who worked with the Smithsonian Institution, he was a contemporary of Whitney's, and you could say he was more highly placed in the scientific establishment at that time. And he wrote, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, 
If Dr. Whitney had understood the theory of human evolution as it's understood today, in light of the Java Man discoveries that I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier in our talk, if he had understood the theory of human evolution, he wouldn't have announced those conclusions, despite the imposing array of testimony with which he was confronted. And I'll just translate that. You know, if, if the facts didn't support mm -hmm. the theory, then those facts should have not been published. They should, he should have understood yep. this can't possibly be true. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the cases, I think, yep. where you've got some very, very good evidence placing a, an anatomically modern human presence mm -hmm before or right at the very beginning of the time that the first apes and monkeys who would be the proposed ancestors of yeah. such anatomically modern humans came so into so existence. what you're suggesting is is that the modern human species may have preceded other primates rather than have uh, descended from them well that's one way to look at it. Another way to look at it might be that we really don't even understand the true history of primates. Mm -hmm. uh, I've concentrated in my work on the extreme antiquity of the human species, the anatomically modern human species, and it turns out to be quite different from uh, what we're being told according to the mm -hmm. modern scientific mm -hmm. consensus. So the actual history of primates and other species may also oh. be different. Good but, point. Mm -hmm. But I haven't really looked into okay. that. But what I would say is that if we look at all of the evidence, the pattern that emerges is one of coexistence rather than evolution. Mm -hmm. That humans like us have coexisted with various species of apes, monkeys, and morphologically intermediate types of creatures hominids. that we would call ape men or mm -hmm. hominids. Mm -hmm. The pi picture that emerges is one of coexistence rather than evolution. And I will say, in 1993, when Forbidden Archaeology first came out, the dominant scientific view was one of linear progression. Mm -hmm where you have you know the primitive apes and monkeys giving rise to the hominins you know ape men which give rise to anatomically modern humans and it was more or less a linear mm -hmm. progression mm -hmm. one developing into the other you often see diagrams uh, in in various <laughs> textbooks sort of showing that linear progression right. from stooped over to fully upright humans but now mm -hmm. the dominant scientific consensus is that human beings like ourselves homo sapiens coexisted mm -hmm. in the past with various species of hominins. So that's an example of science coming in the years since mm -hmm. Forbidden Archaeology was published. It's an example of science coming closer to one of yeah. the ideas that we express there, mm -hmm. the idea of the coexistence of humans with various hominin species mm -hmm. and species of apes and monkeys. Yeah. Of course, in the world of science today, that coexistence doesn't go very far back in time. It goes back a couple of hundred thousand years. They're saying it's likely 
that humans like us coexisted with Neanderthals, with Homo erectus, maybe with some other as yet unknown species mm -hmm. of hominins. There's one uh, that's uh, become uh, spoken about in recent years, the Denisovans, mm. based on some discoveries that were made in Siberia. So this idea that humans like us coexisted with other hominin types is something that's now become more mm -hmm. mainstream. Mm -hmm. Yes, I remember uh, in my younger years, I was taught that modern humans go back maybe 40,000 years only. So to go from 40,000 to maybe 300,000 is uh, a move in the direction that you're proposing. Absolutely. Actually, when I was doing the research and writing for Forbidden Archaeology, which appeared in 1993, the dominant consensus at that time was humans like us, Homo sapiens, sapiens, came into existence about 100,000 years ago. Now the dominant consensus is 200,000 years, and it's moving towards 300,000 based on some discoveries of skulls from a site in Morocco mm -hmm. you know, that were published just this year, I think, uh, that go back about 300,000 years. These skulls have features like those of anatomically modern humans. So I look at these new developments as tiny steps in the right direction, but I think they've got a long way to go before they come to a truly accurate estimation of mm -hmm. the antiquity of our mm -hmm. species. Well, I think it's it's fair to give our viewers a little preview of uh, some of the interviews that we still plan to do while you're here. Okay. And 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 that is to talk about the the concept of human devolution that uh, you wrote about in your subsequent book, uh, based on uh, a lot of evidence from parapsychology and psychical research, plus your study of uh, Vedic. Uh, literature and uh, study of the you know, cosmologies of different cultures around uh, the globe that really what you're proposing is that this data that you uncovered and presented in, in your first book, Forbidden Archaeology, suggests perhaps a whole new way of thinking about what it means to be human. It certainly does to me. Mm -hmm. Now, as I said, uh, in Forbidden Archaeology, we just presented the archaeological evidence that contradicts the current dominant theories yeah. about human origins and antiquity. Mm -hmm. Now, if that evidence is taken seriously, that means we need to be thinking about new explanations for human origins. And there are many possible explanations that could, could be given. But I didn't want to give my own alternative explanation in that book, Forbidden sure. Archaeology, because I wanted people to be free to think about their own explanations, mm -hmm. what new explanations would make sense to them. I told myself, I'm going to save my alternative explanation for another book, mm -hmm. and that is Human Devolution, a Vedic Alternative mm -hmm. to Darwin's Theory. Mm -hmm which I'm happy we're going to get a chance to talk about. Well, can I guess maybe just to give our viewers a little bit of preview of, of what we'll be talking about, we, we can say that um, your vision of, of humanity is uh, uh, incorporates a lot of data from uh, spiritual literature and from psychical research and parapsychology, suggesting, if and I correct me if I'm wrong, that um, 
you hold something of a dualistic view that I mean, you're really focusing on the idea that humans exist can exist in a disembodied spiritual form and and that and have a very real uh, presence at at that level, which isn't well understood today by science. Yes. In Forbidden Archaeology, I presented evidence that contradicts the current theories of human origins. But in human devolution, what I suggest is before we even ask the question, where did human beings come from, we should first of all ask the question, what is a human being? Because how do we know if we've explained it or not if we don't even know what it is? Yeah. So today, many scientists will say that a human being or any other form of organism is just a complex machine made of molecules. In other words, we're just a complex arrangement of matter, and mm -hmm. that's all there is to it. That's all you need to explain it. But I think if we look deeper into the data that comes to us from various fields of scientific research, we're going to see it's more reasonable to say that a human being is made of three things, ordinary matter, molecules, yes. That's part of what a human being is. But beyond that, there are subtle mental and intellectual energies that have a real presence in our human form and which can't be reduced to chemistry or physics as we know them today. And beyond that, there is a conscious self. So when I speak about devolution, it means accepting that essentially we are conscious selves that have not evolved up from matter, but have devolved or come down into the association of matter from some higher mm -hmm. level or plane of existence. Well, uh, we do plan to do at least three more conversations in uh, which we go into uh, greater detail on uh, this idea, which uh, is consistent with a lot of empirical evidence and also consistent with, uh, as you point out in, in human devolution, with the cosmologies of dozens and dozens of uh, human societies. So, um, Michael Cremo, uh, it's been a pleasure uh, having this discussion with you. Thank you so much for being with me. Great to be with you again once more after so many years. Yes, it is indeed. And thank you for being with us.